So, yes, it's the birthday lecture, and this is the one that, you know, uh, again, requested by the audience. Not this audience, though, right here, which is, you know, why it's, it's, it's slightly, you know, a bummer, but, uh, you know, not the most fitting thing to do, generally speaking, talk should always be aimed, of course, but only really at the audience in that's present. Mm. However, because it's, it's my birthday, <laughs> it has been requested by some people, and at least before the retreat, or like, you know, like when I was planning the retreat, I noticed that, of course, that it's my uh, birthday, it's going to be during the retreat. It's something I, uh, I thought was, you know, an interesting idea, something I endeavored to do. So yeah, it's a, like a bare bones version of, of my own kind of path, um, or some of the kind of key aspects of it. So um, yes, I'm 32 years old. Not very old, not very young, I would say. Like not not very young. Still, of course. I consider myself young, and that's that's like. And who isn't, you know? When are you really not young anymore? Good old, you know, thing, you know. You're basically you grow old when you when you like really old. Uh, like of course, you know, if you retire, so in a happy old age. But then also sometimes, you know, if you relinquish perhaps some things in life. One of which I feel is a spirit of inquisitiveness. A spirit of wanting to find out how things are, for example. Which is the... I think this, the core essence of, of any spiritual tradition. Um, on top of freedom from suffering, to some extent. So, in basically any spiritual tradition, you, would ha you have these two aspects. And also in spiritual seekers, you have these two aspects, at least, or this is one model, and of course all, all models are, you know, in, in, this, in the Buddhist sense, we'd say they're empty, that, you know, they're not models, they're not really facts as such. But uh, you have these two things, and yes, some spiritual, you know, seekers emphasize one over the other, and I used, I don't, nowadays no longer do so, but I used to do so with all new students, that uh, I asked them, are you more motivated by a search for truth or a search for liberation, for freedom from suffering? Are you more motivated by suffering or are you more motivated by truth? And I think, yes. Uh, one is probably never quite, you know, old, at least in a negative sense, in, in a, some other sense than, than that they would actually embrace it, at least, you know, mentally, or psychologically, or spiritually. Unless one relinquishes, you know, any sense of curiosity about the world, and curiosity about how they function, and how their mind function, and curiosity about how life like what the deepest potential in life could be. But yes, I'm 32. Not very, not very old in, in, by any metric. Not very young by at least my metric, because I have been younger in the past. And uh, I definitely, I mean, in, to some extent, you know, of course, you know, like basically anyone who really is a is, is, you know, becomes a really hardcore seeker at, you know, which I also did, you know, a relatively young age. I was still, you know, even like, you know, as a very small child, like very, very curious, incredibly curious, incredibly active, you know, hyperactive even, uh, running around, you know, and running from my parents in trains and just kind of like, like scuttling through the, the crowded train, you know, like, like my, my mom and my parents split when I was three, my, uh, they divorced and so I've always kept in touch with my dad, you know, I lived with my mom. And my mom had to kind of, you know, 
chase me around. Uh, it's called a Duracell bunny because I always leaped around in front of the you know the, the crowd. You know. Like was uh, if you know I don't know walking with um, adults or or even sometimes with you know peers, I kind of leaped somewhere you know ran up, ran around in the front. You know. um, but though there was that curiosity, you know, really, you know, spiritual seeking, you know, did not really begin you know, until I was like maybe 15 or so, if I recall correctly. Now, I was born to secular parents in a secular household, which is very, you know, kind of scientifically minded. And I was too very scientifically minded. And my, my big brother especially was very very much into in very, this kind of very hardcore what was quite popular uh, in the you know in the early zeros you know um, and late, late 90s but especially the early zeros you know the very very you know start of the, that decade was this kind of uh, very strong like atheism uh, like Richard, Daw uh, Richard Dawkins and uh, Christopher Hitchens and, and some other kind of you know um, Daniel Dennett, some of these writers, very, very much against any form of religion. You know, that religion is like one one could even call it like misotheist, so to say. Like which means a hatred of God. You know. Definitely a lot of that going around then. And my elder brother was also my four years older than me. I looked looked up to him in many ways. With a very critical eye, also in many ways, but you know, he, well, I listened to the music he did and so on, and I also, you know, had this, you know, very strong scientific streak, which I had for a very long time. However, when I was like fifteen or so, I had the first, I would say, really kind of spiritual experience when I was, you know, uh, back then I was into poker, online poker, and I wanted to own a casino, and I uh, smoked cigars wore sunglasses everywhere, which is, you know, like a very kind of mid-teen thing to do, I think, you know, all of that. But then one night, because summer breaks were long, and I was always a night owl, and I said, I'm a bit of a night owl, I like staying up late. Because when you stay up late, you have, you know, much like, you know, in Buddhism, you know, like a classical thing, and not only in that tradition, like, and not only in India, really, the watches of the night, you know, you stay up sometimes late because it's introspective and you don't have the hassle of you know, everyday life. You don't have the hassle of other people either. You're alone and you have time to really kind of delve into yourself. So one night I did, I did this. I stayed up very late and then around 4 a.m. it was already light. Like as you noticed in, in Finland at this time of year, it's very light, very early. Um, I went outside with, with, with a cigar and smoked a cigar at uh, the yard of my old, like my elementary school, which I had then of course graduated from, into high school and then into, you know, I think by then, yeah, I was, yeah, it was somewhere between high school and upper high school, so we call it all and Lukio in Finnish. And I was there, like, you know, smoking the cigar, and there was no, nobody anywhere to be seen. Uh, very quiet, but the sun was in the sky, and there was this, like, fa like familiar streets of my home shop, suburb, and I kind of, I think this, oh, no, kind of called, I had, like, a feeling of some form of oneness with, with everything, like, this kind of, you know, this strong kind of, uh, I remember a bit vaguely, but I remember being moved, to tears and I had this feeling that somehow you know the sun shone very brightly for me in some way and I, I and I kind of felt nature you know I felt the the beauty of it you know kind of the beauty of nature I felt the beauty of the buildings and I felt the beauty of this, the suburb and the street also and I walked this kind of this past this um Pizzeria, we, we always frequented with, with like you know everyone at the high school and the same like and the elementary school they were close together, like everyone at the same pizzeria always. And we walked past it, no one ever anywhere to be seen. I walked just in the street, like the no no cars, no one driving, just no. And I felt also very yeah, I remember very free, 
to move, you know, very free to be, you know, no obstacles, no one anywhere, no cars, nothing, no one sees me. I, think I could basically do whatever I want. Only the, I remember only the kind of TikTok kind of the, the talking sound and like talk, talk, talk this kind of this um um the um the the, the street lights the, the kind of the like uh, which tell you that when you when you can walk or you have to or you can't you know cross the street you know these um, there's a word for them I can't remember anyhow these kind of um, lights and talking otherwise very quiet and at that time you're also in the summer when birds weren't singing very much either so very very quiet just that kind of talking so and that kind of started some something in me in some sense because I remember that relatively soon afterwards I was interested in the occult for the first time and there's a very guilty pleasure because my elder brother was not into that at all you know, he was like really kind of you know against anything like that or like you know he 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 did not or like not against he just didn't find it interesting at all nowadays he does interest in it nowadays my elder brother is very much into christian mysticism or like neoplatonism and these things you know, he, he found another kind of it there than i did even though i also i, I enjoy those things greatly but for me like you know it was different things taoism and buddhism eventually but yeah the occult and you know, reading H.P. Lovecraft and lots of horror. And I got it very much into horror also, and I'm, I'm still a great, great fan of horror movies and series, you know, horror fiction. And I think it's a great form of art, which is often overlooked because our fears and sufferings, you know, fears are relevant to what we are afraid of. It's relevant. And horror portrays, you know, to the best extent that, you know, especially the greatest horror artist and the greatest, you know, Fiction writers like I like H.P. Lovecraft, for example. You know the whole the whole cosmic horror thing. You know what what's the terror in the unknown, the vast you know vast unknown primordial sea of the cosmos, which we simply have not mapped out to like any significant extent. The only thing we know about it, and H.P. Lovecraft already knew by then, is that it's incredibly vast. You know, just incredibly vast. You know. It's so vast that it's incomprehensible, to us at least. But then, still, yes, very much into science and very much into, into kind of, you know, into um, very much, you know, materialist in my outlook, my philosophical outlook. That the world is composed primarily of matter, uh, mind is a mat material phenomenon, and um, and I also remember in upper high school, this one moment, nowadays it's kind of, you know, my mind is very, very silent. I feel and think most things in my body, which to many of you might, to some of you might sound weird, um, and to some of you might sound very familiar. Um, but yeah, back then I had a very messy mind and a very quiet body and nowadays I have a very quiet mind and a super messy body um, which is you know quite actually you know I find this to be much more interesting and also you know I find the body you know the energy body so I say to be a more nuanced mirror for what happens outside also especially other people how other people feel like for example back then i didn't have an active energy body which you know i know to some people who might watch this especially i know that might be surprising because uh, it's something i've been known for you know as, as, as quite an you know relatively some expertise in energy body stuff uh, but back then uh, no energy body really I can't remember feeling emotions in my body basically at all, only cognitively. And I remember this this thing. Nowadays, I love emotions. You know, I I, I love uh, I love all kinds of energy phenomena. I love feeling things. I mean, it, it's great riches. But back then, I remember in upper high school there was this moment uh, that in a in a in a Finnish class, you know, language class, 
I, at some point, you know, there's some discussion. I always, you know, of course, talk with my friends and everything, but there was something the teacher said. I, I don't remember what, but then I, I rose my hand and I, I, I said this very weird comment, which I feel nowadays very much disagree with. I said that that I that, that my greatest wish is to be free of all emotions, so that there would only be reason and no emotion, no feeling. And what a poor thing that would be. A very luciferian world in some sense. Not only reason, but no no kind of richness, no color, no I didn't even only mean, you know, I, I wouldn't feel anything in the body. I meant no emotion, really, like a robot, you know. And just or like, like chat GPT or something, like an artificial intelligence. So, because then nothing would hinder my reason from being somehow perfect. Because I felt that, of course, in upper high school, I was, I'd been bullied in high school and upper high school and also in late elementary school because I was, I didn't grow up physically very much, you know. I had this thing, um, my dad had like, you know, ex the poorest eyesight, I, I, I doubt anyone has ever heard of the poorer, like greater myopia nearsightedness, minus 14 diopters. That's like, that's crazy high. The, no the normal thing for people with glasses is like minus half to minus 1.5. He had minus 14, like blind as a bat, you know, really blind as a bat. And the second poorest eyes that I have ever heard of was my own, minus 7. I was almost blind, blind as a bat, you know, as well. It was only like um, after upper high school that I had an epiphany that I have to do something about my eyesight and my mom very courteously and she's a very very empathetic and very you know, beautiful human being in many ways and a very loving mother and she paid for surgery but I also that was like a great stigma for me I, I basically lost eyesight in that sense without glasses the, the glasses was fine but you know lost eyesight without glasses you know at the at fourth grade in elementary school and at the same time I did I had not grown almost at all you know from what I had been in like you know kindergarten and others grew and grew and I was still you know a scrawny little runt and what is greater in an in a biological sense what is a greater danger to to a human you know like an animal than being a scrawny little runt they're they're killed you know they're killed off you know parents in you know, in many, many, you know, cultures, you know, not anymore, perhaps, but for, for the, almost the entirety of human history, as we know it, scrawny little runs were killed off because they're a hindrance, you know, they're, they're useless, you know, in, in, in more natural conditions with more physical labor, they're useless, you know, and they're just, you know, they, they just hinder people, especially if they're blind, <laughs> blind as a bat, you know, so like these stigma, stigmas were very, you know, painful for me. So I became, I had been very active physically and so on, but I became shy and awkward and then I was bullied. And this continued in, in high school. I was shy and awkward and nerdy and just, you know, read Wikipedia all the time and played World of Warcraft and, you know, hang, hung around with the internet. I had some friends, but they, whenever I had friends, they ended up bullying me. <laughs> quite, 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 you know, at, at some point, you know, eventually. Because they saw this, you know, this great, great sense of shame, like great, great sense of shame in me. And it was that exactly that, you know, at the age of 18, uh, after upper high school, when I had again been bullied and, for example, sexually humiliated in the sense that, you know, that um, I had this, this um, because I also, also stuttered quite heavily. You know, I, was a, I was a mess, you know, in many ways. I stuttered, I was completely reliant on my eyesight. Uh, or my eyeglasses, and uh, and I had this, you know, this, this, I never changed, you know, I always wore the same black hoodie and the same black jeans, and people made fun of it too, and I, I didn't care about appearance, because I was afraid that if I changed something about my appearance, people would know that I cared, and then they would bully me even more, so I tried to be a rock, I tried to ignore it, like, I tried to not respond to it when I was bullied, or when they, they had this, there was this, this nickname, in first, like the first name was made up in high school, but then it continued in upper high. Uh, it's Sönk, which for those who understand Finnish, it has this, this great connotations of, of stuttering. And, uh, and it kind of, you know, it basically is like a very, like a, like a yeah, an, an, a nasty nickname. And then there was this experience, I was in, in, in a class, I had my upper high school crush. 
uh, my high school crush had basically, I, she was the first girl I had approached with some, you know, like, I, I liked her, and she, she told me, she doesn't have time for this. <laughs> you know, that was it, you know, like she was saying, doesn't have time for this, it's, it's ridiculous, like, no way. So, uh, so in upper high school, I had a crush, and I was in German class with her, and then this, you know, and we were kind of close, I felt this tension, we were kind of close, and we played World of Warcraft, Warcraft together also, and we also danced with the, uh, yeah, there's on the second class, of, on the second year of upper high school, we had these dances, but that was super awkward, because like, I couldn't look at her with the eye, and my palms were sweaty as hell, and you know, all of this kind of thing, and you know, she was really awkward, and everything was really awkward, and, but yeah, this, this guy's bars in the classroom, and they started using this nickname, when I felt so close, and I felt shattered, like sexually shattered. So then I had this, this thing, you know, after upper high school, I decided something, like, a thing that actually, and one reason why I, even though there's, I feel great danger, and I was seeing this in both in myself and in others, you know, there's great danger in, 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 in hallucinogens. What basically, at that time, turned things around for me was, I took psychedelics for the first time. And after a few trips, I looked at myself, on a trip, I looked at myself in the mirror with my glasses and my weird haircut that, um, that some girls, you know, laughed at that it looked like I had so much hair gel that they, they, they said it looked like um, uh, Kinovsky, so this kind of, you know, this uh, caramel, a cream caramel or something, you know, and all of this kind of, it's just like, you know, uh, something had to be done. I couldn't go on like this. I had the feeling that if I go on like this, I would become at most a musty professor, you know, surrounded by, you know, books and books and books who, who no one would ever love and like, care for. This was what I felt about myself. And so I looked at myself in the mirror, something has to be done. So then I had this, yeah, yes, I asked my mother, you know, who, could she, you know, like this is, you know, this is hurting. And she knew it, she, she knew it by the glass and everything, my reliance on them, like, you know, it, that, that it, it was a stigma. Uh, so yes, eye surgery, and then I immediately afterwards I shaved my head, you know, like just a buzz cut. And then I went, you know, I I had gotten inside uh, the university, passed the examinations to study philosophy, theoretical philosophy, and I started studies there. And I had this, even though it only lasted a few few, few years, I was so shattered, you know, sexually that I had this kind of homosexual face for a while, which is, you know, there's nothing wrong in it by any means, but, but in my case, I kind of knew that this was a, in my case, it was a defense, and it was never actually sexual, but it was, I had this kind of platonic, ro close romances with, with, with guys at that point, and I finally, and the first people who told me they loved me were men, and it was like, it was like one of my good friends, we became very close with, um, um, and who actually died in September, uh, was the first person to tell me he loved me, right, outside of family. So yes, um, I still was very materialistic, but I kept on, you know, using hallucinogens. And slowly they started opening up, you know, this kind of beast. It was too difficult to kind of explain, like, maybe not to explain in materialistic terms, but it showed me that I really know nothing. Like, it, more and more I kind of felt, I know very little about how the mind works, ultimately. I, I thought I was, like, really wise and everything, and because I was so intelligent, you know, I can take on everything. But I, there was this, for example, with one experience where I took way too many mushrooms, and uh, my mind kind of shattered. And I thought I could take it because I was so intelligent, you know. And that had always been my, 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 the only security I had. At least I'm intelligent. I might become a musty old professor, but at least I have that because I mean, you know, everyone who had always told me I'm intelligent. And I could write. You know, I didn't study for matriculation examinations or for high at all, but I got good marks because I was good in English because I had been online the whole, my whole life. And then in Finnish, because I could write. And the two, the two subjects you don't have to read for. I also took history and tried to read for that a little bit, but then I got B, which is the second lowest score. Um, even though nowadays I'm a history buff, I very much enjoy history, and, and I'm also like, you know, relatively well, well versed in like, uh, world history. But anyway, 
I had this, you know, this this more and more this feeling that I don't understand, you know, I really actually don't understand how things work, which was great for humility. And uh, it started opening up uh, a spiritual sphere for me. However, this took a bit, little bit of a backlash when my this friend uh, Veiko, he, um, he and I we had a year together full of very heavy like exploration with psychedelics and other like other substances, cannabinoids or cannabis, and then you know something called dissociative hallucinogens as well with one substance called methoxetamine. And uh, but then we kind of broke up, you know. Uh, he did could not take it anymore. That I was slightly insufferable. Still, I still had this kind of um, uh, like he was not as good maybe at expressing himself to others, and I was always the person like in our weird platonic couple, romantic, romantic, whatever, really close though, really close couple. And um, and he finally says he 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 um, doesn't want to kind of see me anymore, like doesn't want to hang around with me, with me anymore. And I accepted it, as well, even though it was sad. But then he started using cannabis, especially alone, and became a hermit. And he used you no know, cannabis for maybe three, four months straight, uh, very very heavily uh, alone in his you know, room without not much contact, and became more and more and more weird. And we, I saw it, but I did not want to say anything because I was afraid that, you know, I didn't want to impose my will on him anymore. You know, he wanted to be free of me, so I couldn't. You know, who would I be to say that? You no, know, hey, I think you're, I think you're doing something, you no, know, crazy or whatever, or becoming crazy in some sense. But um, yes, then finally. He kind of he went so kind of mad that he had to be kind of he had to he started doing weird weird stuff you know in public and he was um, put in in, in a, an institution uh, and he had this great this fantasy about a Finnish philosopher. Uh, first he was a great fan and he he imitated his voice in a very weird way like all mannerisms everything in a way that people don't usually do even with their idols. But then suddenly there was this this he had this experience he he had gone to you know meet this philosopher uh, after a lecture and the philo and apparently the philosopher did not have very much time to speak with him and he was a person who had basically been because he was not he was a bit weird and you know like people don't get schizophrenia if they don't have usually if they have some kind of predispositions or predisposition to towards it he. He was turned down, or like the philosopher was like, you know, okay, okay, okay. Again, this the same thing we would do with we could do with suffering, like okay, okay, okay. Like, like just listened a few words, but didn't engage. And then suddenly it switched, and my friend Veiko, he started vilifying this philosopher. He saw that he 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 uh, told us that this this philosopher was a witch, uh, a black hole, a fraud, an imposter, and and like you know basically sucking the life out of everyone around him uh, and uh, has to be stopped but he was fortunately shut down in institution however they did a, they did a bit of a mistake like a really really a, a grave error in judgment three days after he was put there he was granted his first day of leave so he could leave the institution even though he had when we went to visit him he had been like you know crazier than anyone i have ever seen in my life and i've seen quite a lot of you know insane crazy people on all kinds of trips and you know like all all kinds of I've never seen any smell like this he was sweating very very heavily very very pale looking either very very high and speaking in a high voice or very very down and speaking in a very deep voice and telling us things like it's a well no, well known commonly known fact that we, that people that people are given antipsychotics uh, so that they would have heart attacks and then beca become homosexual it's like you know very very common knowledge indeed uh, very sad though because he was he was given leave even though when we went to meet him he tried to escape be, like behind us you know and just I think two days after he was given leave and he went and stabbed this philosopher uh, who did not die fortunately but still that's a life sentence if you're so crazy that you go and stab someone 
you oftentimes never get out of an institution in your life. Or at least it will take you know, decades. So I also saw quite heavily like how crazy things can become. You know? And he's not the only person I've seen you know, who has, has had the same thing happen. It not, not, I, I have not foreseen have seen, you know, that it's someone stabbed someone. But um, I kept on my explorations to, to some, some degree going on. Um, but started, started slowly getting, yeah, my spiritual opening started kind of, maybe even what happened to Bake for them, who, you know, he lived a very lo- good life after that, even, even though he was in an institution. First, you know, uh, at the institution for the criminally insane for four, three or four years, and then at a, just like a mental institution, institution for four years. But he got, you know, even a week at a time off to be, you know, come to Helsinki and hang, hang around with people, go to festivals in, in, the, in the summers and so on. And he was very, like, I, I say so many things about him because he was such an important figure in my life, of course. He was a, um, he did so, he did all the things one could ever think of, that one could do in a mental institution, shut down, shut, shut in, shut down even in that sense, you know, or cancelled, you know, really cancelled, mm-hmm. much like you'd have an internet culture. He was quite, he was quite heavily cancelled uh, in, in that sense, but um, he acted in plays, he gave speeches, you know, like uh, for example, when Finland was got his, its 100th year of independence. He gave. He was invited to give a speech because by then he was actually quite eloquent. I mean, he started becoming better and better at expressing himself. And with antipsychotic medication, he was no longer crazy. Like he did not have that, you know, those the symptoms. Mm. He kept on his his own studies of philosophy, deep studies of history, you know. Uh, and he he got to in, to the university to study uh, history uh, on his first go. Which is not very easy, and, and started getting like high marks on exams uh, from you know, studying from a mental institution from a distance, which, uh, frankly, like a, 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 a psychiatrist once said that this he had, had you know who works with you know who has worked with psychotic people for most of, most of their career uh, told me once that he's never seen anything like this uh, in his career that someone could do that thing from a mental, the mental institution for the criminally insane uh, to get inside university that fast and get, you know, basically top marks, being schizophrenic and being in those conditions you know, on heavy, a very heavy antipsychotic medication because Veiko, without the medication, he would like just flip you know, very fast into some kind of very weird Nietzschean manic, manic sphere of just, you know, just like, like really, really, really high up. But yes, with the medication, you know, under control, he was a great mind, great fireball mind, great person in, in, in many ways. Mm, you know, wrote in the newspaper, you know, hospital newspaper, not very big, but still, you know, did everything he could, you know. And um, yes, and that kind of, you know, seeing that, you know, his kind of fate, uh, it... Of course, you know the stabbing and everything. What what happened to him? The initial thing, even though he had he had eight more years of life uh, before dying in September. Now, unfortunately, in a fire, he was just about to be, to get free this spring, and he was just about to. He, it was a month or two months before he he um, his thirtieth birthday. So that's a relatively tragic fate. However, eight years where he was happier than I think he had been ever. He was, instead of with his sad eyes in his teenage photos, and you know, before, before we had our group, our circle of friends who we did crazy stuff together, you know, it was not just him and me, but also a few other good friends. After that, he was smiling in photos, this weird kind of, uh, this kind of, a bit crazy smile, even with, but, but still like this kind of glint, this happy glint in his eyes. It's not, it's not like crazy, you have happy glint. And yeah, he likes festivals, the tant- Tantra festivals, all of these kind of, like, you know, was re- very much into, into this kind of spiritual stuff, like later in his life. But seeing the, the stabbing and what happened to him, the initial thing, right away, it was a big, of course, heavy crisis on me. And I think that started something that, that I, I had to kind of 
it opened this like a spiritual sphere in me not just you know this what it, ha it had the psychedelics and everything had brought up before this kind of feeling that i don't really know how things are but still being very kind of materialistic and very scientifically oriented or purely scientifically oriented but actually that i wanted to kind of there's something in that you know that there was something perhaps deeper to life than just empirical science at least mm. And not just something that might be only eternally kind of, you know, just, you know, some vague thing which I alone try to, you know, build up from scratch, you know, some kind of theory of everything or something. But uh, that, you know, yes, there are traditions. And there's a lot of good people, a lot of interesting people in history, uh, very wise people who might have some great things to say, important things to say. And uh, the big trigger for that was Alan Watts, also. Alan Watts. Uh, Great, uh, one of the biggest people and the most important people in, in bringing Zen to the West. <laughs> Zen Buddhism. He was a student of Daisen State or Suzuki, who was the one single person who brought, you know, Zen to the West. Theravada Buddhism had been brought before, slightly before, by some, um, like you know, even in the mid uh, 19th century. And for, for example, the philosopher Arthur Schopenhauer was, a, was very much into Buddhism in 1850 or so. But yes, Watts was a student of, of Suzuki, who had you know, been a translator of, of Japanese and, and English, quite early one, you know, and, and, but was very, very well versed in, in, he was a Zen Buddhist, you know, like a, a master also. And Alan Watts was into Zen. And I read his way, The Way of Zen, which is a good book. It's a very good book. I can recommend on, on Zen and the history of Zen. But also there's this book, Tao, The Water Course Way, on Taoism. And in Taoism, there's this, this idea of, of Wei Wu Wei in, in Chinese, which is that the best course of action always is to abstain from action and allow you know, things to take their own course. Uh, which is the, a very close cognate of the, in the Christian mysticism you have the same thing, kenosis, it means empty yourself and, or, and you know, basically let God or whatever, you know, whatever entire to kind of, you know, flow through you. Or this whole idea, you know, don't let the right hand know what the left hand is doing, you know, that's the same, same point, I would think. Or in Buddhism, you know, in Buddhist schools, the same thing. Following river yoga, for example, in in in, uh, in, in early Tibetan Buddhism, um, and um, many other words for like you know, in that tradition also for the same thing. Anyhow, I, I got into Taoism. Uh, and then also Christian mysticism to some extent. But then in late 2014, and the philosopher had been stabbed in early, in January 2014, or already in late 2014, like in the summer of 2014, I had gone to festivals, boom festival, which I'm going to be teaching this summer. Actually, I went to in there in 2014 as a participant, and now I'm going to go teach there. It's the biggest psychedelic hippie festival in Europe, 40,000 participants or so. It's like, you know, the European burning man in some, to some extent. I'm very happy to go there this, this July uh, because it's a, it's a great place with a great freedom of expression and very warm atmosphere. Uh, I went there like more, you know, the spiritual awakening stuff. And then in, in December 2014, I went to Thailand. So I started traveling alone that year, you know, in general. I'd been to Florence, you know, I'd been to Paris, you know, and, and you know, yes, Portugal for, for Boom Festival and then Hungary for this kind of sun festival and another hippie, like hippie festival. And I had also gotten to dancing. I love dancing. I dance a lot, you know, it's a something, it's a hobby. I dance, you know, in dance classes, but I dance also like uh, very much in, in parties, you know, techno parties, could be whatever, whatever parties actually, you know, drum and bass, but lots of electronic music, but also you know, anything that, you know, has a 
has some rhythm to it, you know. I also took ballet lessons, but that didn't fit. Um, because I was I also had pra- sort of practiced Tai Chi, you know, which I've practiced now for you know I started it in, in in fall 2014. I've now practiced it since then. I have taught it for I think three years now as an assistant teacher. Um, um, in uh, this kind of uh, Dong family lineage, which is now there directly lineage from Yang Cheng Fu, who was the kind of founder of, of modern kind of Yang style Tai Chi, like now you know, even though that whole Tai Chi comes goes goes back like six, seven hundred years. Uh, but yeah, I went to Thailand in December 2014, and there, of course, Buddhism again, not just Zen, and not just no, which which has had kind of turned in my in my interest into Taoism. But Theravada Buddhism and meditation. I went there you know, at the first night in Bangkok. Uh, I had this very weird uh, night, which I back then could not have actually could not have mentioned to ev- anyone without basically fearing great loss of you know great shame and so on. But I I met a local you know um, local guy who went eating. Uh, eating some food, uh, drinking very heavily, and he suggested to me, let's go to a brothel. And I was very drunk, of course, we were both very drunk, but I was like, no, I don't have money. And he was like, no, I can, I, I, I'll, you pay later. Went to a brothel, and I had a, a pretty terrifying sexual experience, because uh, it's it's not, you know, it was surreal. There was this window pane, I was, I was sat on a sofa, incredibly drunk, uh, and there was a behind the window pane, there was a group of women. I like just spread across and like pick one. I was like, no. okay, like picking one and then like having this very awkward experience because I was very shy with, with women. Um and then that the whole thing cost like 350 euros, you know, like all of it, you know, included. That was a lot for one night for me at that at that point. So I, so the, the trip started quite you know on the wrong foot in some sense. But then I went to Northern Thailand in Chiang Mai, and there was this monastery, Wat Umong, and I went there, uh, and I saw that they offered that you could stay there for retreat, you know, and it cost like two euros per night, food and you know, bed, you know, bed and board, everything included, incredibly cheap, actually something I can recommend to anyone. If you really want to, if you want to try being a monk, by far the easiest thing to do is go to Thailand or Burma or somewhere, find a monastery, and then you know, like, like, and ask around. Actually, the guy who had taken me to the brothel, he had told me that if you're interested in Buddhism, go to this this place, go to Wat Wong. So yeah, I mean, like, took me to a brothel, but also took me to a monastery. So you know, yeah. But uh, yeah, I went there. I I, I saw. A few euros per night, you know, and everything included. And I, I thought about it, you know, for a while. I went to Chiang Mai, you know, like uh, did some zip lining, you know, everything, all that kind of stuff you do in when you're in Asia. And, or, you know. Yeah, when you're in, especially in Asia. Also, when I in this January when I was in India on pilgrimage, yeah, I did some like or, no, I we were meant to do a zip lining, but we in Rishikesh, but we didn't have time. Anyhow, I really wanted to do it though because it's fun. I like hunting. You know, so much, so many fun things you can do, so many innocent fun things, like deep planning, very innocent. Um, anyhow, yeah, then I decided, okay, even though I have, the, the trip is not very long, I was planning to just be like three, three kind of uh, weeks maybe in Thailand, like, or like that was the most I, I had. And it was like, no, I said, okay, let's do three days, or three nights, three nights, but like, no. Yes, it's three nights or four days, pretty much. Uh, there uh, for basically free, uh, which was also good for my expenses. And it was very interesting, you know. Uh, there was a there was a monk there who taught us basic meditation techniques, anapanasati, basically. But in this way that you, we 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 did this that we breathe breathed in and then uh, with every breath, you know, we tried to feel uh, sometimes one point in the lower right back. Next breath, a point in the lower left back, and then like you know, the middle of the back and the upper back, and different kind of points while you breathe in and out. I have never tried it since, and I didn't really try it even then very, very much because I was 
too you know busy trying to feel all kinds of weird the chakra points and all this kind of and it was just a mess it, the meditation was a mess for me but staying there and there's this wonderful little pond there like I, I, you, I, we were all clad in white you know, I, and there were people other westerners were staying there as well and uh, there was no the bed was a was a bamboo mat and the pillow was uh, was wooden and uh, of, of course no it's it's warm but there's uh, no but uh, there was no window okay so geckos and everything were inside um, and uh, no hot water so it's quite ascetic but still very beautiful and there was especially this there's one monk who was very haughty he I had in Bangkok I'd found the Dhammapada which is like a collection of the Buddha saying like this very short collection but it's one of the most common books people read in, in, in Buddhism as well it's, it's like it's it's very concise but it has lots of very beautiful poetry there and uh, but it, I had a translation so there was this haughty monk who kind of you know one like he just snatched it from my hand when, when I was reading it reading was allowed but he snatched it from my hand and like said the translator's name like Thomas by you know and then like threw it back to me this, this kind of he always frowned when he saw when he saw me or any of us really but there was also this other monk who had taken a vow, vow of silence for at least like some some period of time and whenever he, he and i got eye contact he would just like you know burst and like <laughs> like just like like big laughter and always like smiles and everything and he was like really really warm-hearted and that you know also told me that there's something to this he was really really happy mm. So yeah, I got into Buddhism, and of course that has continued to, to continue to this day. Um, but also other traditions still, yeah. And uh, by then, actually, I had this this thing, this um, that I had still taken quite a lot of hallucinogens. Um, one could say even increasingly so, and I had this experience. Uh, like when I came back from Thailand, I had I had for a long time struggled uh, with kind of you know with um, wondering whether there's any you know, whether there's any point to it. And it had very it had become a, quite difficult, you know. It's one could say too much in, in many ways. And uh, but then I decided that okay, fuck it, you know, let's go. Like I had struggled with also with other kinds of drug abuse so like, like i had taken opioids i had taken like you know uh you know stimulants like everything i, I had a list you know i had like you know 83 different compounds you know like lots of different stuff you know and uh, but I, but and it had been for a, for a while so confusing what to do with it so i just said the only thing i will see is if i if i see i see this thing through and then I got into a into a four month long in 2015 spring 2015 four or five months of of increasing uh, mystical experience oneness with God you know uh, telepathy synchronicities these kind of coincidences you know that everything is full of you know coincidence and it even got so heavy that at times I felt that solipsism was was the I you know solipsism which is the like the one perhaps the greatest philosophical mon like the the boogeyman in also in western philosophy is solipsism that's the idea that it comes from like sol ipse like it means only i so only i exist and no one else and the experiences you know that i got into that spring were so crazy and so incredible to uh, so so incredible but so impossible to kind of comprehend and to to integrate with anything else I'd ever seen or known about life um, and at times it felt like things became so non-dual that anything I thought was immediately you know it would my internal world and the, the, my outside perception were completely in sync for hours at a time in, completely in sync which is something that you know it's possibly an illusion, but also, you know, you know, like it's it's something that mystical traditions have always, you know, been struggling to explain properly. You know, what the hell is going on there? And I was, you know, collapsing. I was really collapsing in on it because, um, yeah, I had never experienced anything like it before. And um, eventually, I kind of I had this thing. I had taken 
method sheet and exhaust the pollution agenda and synthetic cannabinoids every day um, for three months straight, starting in the morning, going to the bathroom and sniffing some lines and eating some other stuff, and then throughout the day, always going up around a corner somewhere, somewhere, and then like you know, doing some more, and like constantly. And then I went to this, uh, this, this. Uh, I had a, another friend who also became schizophrenic. We also got this close bond. Um, but he's still alive, so I won't also mention his name. But we got this very close bond. Uh, we kind of became part of the crime in, in this kind of in this spirit, crazy with crazy wisdom, as it's called, you know, crazy spiritual sense. Uh, but and he organized a mushroom retreat at a, at a summer cabin with uh, I think seven or eight other people, um, and uh, somehow things went so that. He called me upstairs and he had a bunch of mushrooms in front of him. And uh, he just waited. What am I going to do? And, it, and I don't still quite understand wh what was his intention. I think he intended me to pick one. But I looked at them and he had also, also had these spiritual, Buddhist spiritual artifacts. Like, like, like he told, told me to first like, you know, pick one. And, and, and he saw, how, what would I do with it? He looked at me like, very close. What would I do with it? And later I understood that these were. Uh, these were artifacts linked to different kinds of Dhyani Buddhas, which are wisdom Buddhas. They're like, you know, in Tibetan Buddhism, they're these very high entities you know, of some sort. Tibetan Buddhism is full of, it's, it's very complicated, like there's a big kind of metaphysics to it, you know, which I don't really understand. I'm not very, I'm not very Tibetan Buddhist, you know, in, in my orientation. I've never been primarily at least so. But he saw, like, what am I going to do with these artifacts? You know, a bell, a weird, uh, the horn of a, of a, of some animal. He had, he had actually found in Tibet, you know, when he, when he traveled in Tibet himself. And different things. Then he had the mushrooms, and he just waited. But then, you know, I just started eating them all. And then he would, he, he, at first he was, you know, he put his hand, you know, to kind of stop me slightly, but then he withdrew it. And then he just watched me, what's going to happen? And then uh, what happened to me was incredibly traumatic, incredibly traumatic. One of the biggest traumas of my life, for certain. Uh, I, th I thought I was Krishna. I thought I was, you know, that I was, you know, God. Not just anyone channeling God, or any, like an archetype, or anyone channeling like, uh, like anything, you know, you know, anyone not the hu not the human or or even not you know as some would say you know that perhaps in some sense we are when people have this kind of messiah complexes like some people think they're jesus and so and some people think they're you know maitreya buddha which was the messiah in, in uh, buddhist traditions uh, and so on whatever and of course you know these are esoteric beliefs in these traditions not not that anyone you know who wants to be buddhist has to believe in maitreya buddha that you know there's a messiah coming I would say, as far as I can see, we're all the second coming of, of, of Christ. You know, we all have that you know, humanity and that goodness in us and that love in us. We're all Maitreya Buddha and so on. Why would any, any single person be that? You know? mm, I'm, not, I'm not convinced of that at all. But then I thought that I was Krishna and the others saw it. And I had managed to keep everyone kind of, you know, very kind of in the dark about that, you know, even my psychoanalyst, I had been in psychoanalysis and she, she didn't notice a thing, which was a bit awkward for her later, it was like the whole spring, she hadn't noticed a thing, that anything had, had been going on in me, because I was so good at, you know, covering it, but uh, then they knew, I was to some extent, you know, going insane, and uh, this experience, them seeing it in me and approaching me about it, um, very traumatic, yeah, yeah, socially so crippling that um, it took me years to kind of accept, properly integrate that this had happened. That yes, that it doesn't mean that they hate me, or it doesn't mean that you know they uh, that anything is really. In a, in a very wide sense wrong, it's just that I had gone way too far. Much like many others before me, much like Beiko had done, but no, not as far, no one could say, but still too far. It was enough for me that someone saw, saw it. And then I stopped 
and I stopped all like like I went traveling in Europe I, I had no access to like I didn't want, I did not really even want any you know drugs or any hallucinogens and so on but um, I still had this you know this I had the I Ching like this Chinese book of changes it's, it's like an old Chinese manual of divination and I kind of I, I I had used it very much in that spring, you know, through coins, and then there's the thing you throw coins, then based on those coins you draw lines, and based on those lines you in, you, you look at the book and it gives you an in, an interpret like a text. And I used that like maybe twenty five to thirty times per day, you know, like all the time. I, I sometimes you know I could spend an hour just talking with it, asking it questions, and you know seeing that it somehow responded to me. So I still had that with me when I went traveling, uh, first to a festival and then you know to a cyclic conference in, in London. You know I had it you know from Portugal to London through uh, France and like first first like uh, Spain and then, then France and and so on to Paris and then to London, um, where I had the honor of of being the sound man for Rick Doblin, who's the founder of the like the multidisciplinary association for cyclic studies, which actually like the world's biggest kind of um, association for promoting psychedelic therapy, uh, and the sole reason why MDMA is soon going to get uh, um, um, an FDA-approved medicine in, in the U.S. maybe in like two years, I think, or so, uh, which I think is great for our medicine. But these things, you know, are always not good to be of free use. You know, I think they should be. There should be supervision. And um, yes, I kind of I was traveling, and I still had the itching and everything. And I even met a Jesuit priest, a traveling Jesuit priest, who was on his way to Syria uh, because he wanted to help people. And I convinced him that don't go. He had a limp foot, you know. He had, had, had like damaged his leg, and he was a man. He was maybe fifty or so. Very handsome man. Very kind of char like very great, very charismatic. But we kind of talked about it, and yeah, I gave him like an I Ching thing, like 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 this kind of this a reading of it, and he and it it gave like and he believed in God and everything, and he believed you know in in that there's no coincidence or all this kind of thing, and the text told him that don't go to places which are dangerous, you know, not right now, and he was like you know, okay, and then he he told me that that he's not going to go to Syria, and so and and then he told me that. Like great thanks, um, and something good came out of that. I don't know what would have happened to him in in, in midst of the war and everything, uh, with a limp foot, you know, um, you know, one person there, anyhow. Um, but then yes, I even in the, the the fall, I I once perhaps I I tried to take some kind of hallucinogenic substance. But the moment it started kind of shaking up my worldview, I kind of collapsed and went and cried to my mother that uh, I can't take it anymore. And then I stopped immediately. Like that was, that was the last time. Basically stopped already in the spring, but that was the last kind of straw. And like, no, stopped immediately. And uh, even though since then I have found again value in, in some hallucinogen use. Um, I, for the next three years, I was completely sober, uh, not even alcohol, and I got into, uh, very heavily into meditation, which still, of course, you know, has been the, the greatest and the most stable tool, spiritual tool I know. Uh, and I went to Goenka Vipassana tradition, it was one, you know, retreat, a 10 day retreat, spent a few years in that, that tradition heavily uh, and I was quite you know I felt that this is the only tradition I would I should be in basically this is the best one maybe and um, but then a friend of mine told me you should read the mind illuminated so that's his book and I read it and it kind of blew my mind because like the Goenka tradition has basically no instruction whatsoever uh, it's very very slow. You can get, I think, relatively far with it, but oh, like 90% of the people I know who are only in it, or like maybe 80%, it's 
I think they get a bit stuck, or at least they plateau very fast because there's very little instruction. There's really no progress there. So, um, so then the mind illuminated, blew my mind because it had this robust, you know, theory and practice and everything, and all made sense and all this, you know, taught me so many new things, you know, the cessation experiences and jhanas and all kinds of, you know, things, you know, like all kinds of things, so much in, in, in TMI. So I started practicing that. I went to uh, serve in a, in a, in a um, cruise ship, uh, cleaning cabins that, that summer, best summer gig I know uh, in Finland, because it paid like over 2,000 euros, uh, like 2,400 euros for, for a month tax-free, because the sailor, sailors' union is so powerful, because that sea trade has always been so important in Finland that you know, they, can, they have basically tax-free. Um, like my tax percent was like 0 0.2 um, and everything. Great gig. But, and I listened to the TMI as an audiobook uh, like eight or nine times during that summer. Um, like whole, the, every day, listened to it like for hours. While I was cleaning the cabins all the time, listening to TMI. And then I meditated after every day. And, uh, and then I got uh, in, the, in that uh, fall, um, yes, actually, yeah, 2019, in the fall, I, I went on my last Gwenka retreat with Lee Brasington's book on jhanas. And I learned the, the four, the, the, actually the three first form jhanas on that retreat, uh, to some extent. The first two quite well, the third a little, not so much. But then I also learned that, uh, that oh yes, you don't have to also only do metta, Metta as the Brahmi, as a Brahmi Harapak practice. You have the others, you know, they weren't in the book, but I kind of spread out from the, the, the ability in jhana, which I then learned uh, and understood that, hey, mudita is actually its own state, simply joy, karuna is its own state. I started exploring them as well, upekka as well. Uh, so I got a lot of new practices. I applied for a dedicated practitioner's course at Chuadasa's uh, his um, organization, which was uh, like you no know, prerequisite, so you'd go into teacher training. But unfortunately, my oh, actually fortunately in the end, my application there was a technical error with Google Forms or something, and it did not go through. And I contacted them after like a month or so, a few months, and they were like, "We're very sorry, but we never got your application." I was like, "Damn it!" Because I would have been able to study with a, a student of Shuadasas, which I was doing like, that's amazing. But then you had a teacher training starting, which the DPC, the Dedicated Practitioners course, was a prerequisite. So you first had to do that, and then you could go on to the teacher training, or apply for that. But I applied anyway, and uh, I had been active on Reddit, writing these kind of long essays to, as answers to people, and I had some insight. Um, also from you know, psychoanalysis and all all kinds of you know I had been like six years in psychoanalysis uh, like in total um, or at that point like four but still like no still four and you know, there was two more to go anyhow I applied and uh, they asked me you know can you pay it all in upfront because I had I, I had like I had asked for like and I paid in, in in lump sums then I asked my father you know, can I borrow money for this it's a career thing and he was like you know yes so i got into the teacher training course you know by the shortcut of I, in my application i just put links to my reddit posts and they had made a, an impression to us and then he was like okay come along i was the junior student there the youngest by far uh or like not by that big of margin but you know maybe 10 years or so and uh, I started studying with Chiodasa. This was you no, know, it was a big shortcut into into teaching. That, that's one reason why why I am a teacher and being re relatively you know not very old, not very young, not very old, because of that shortcut. And I'm glad that the DPC, the Dedicated Practitioners Course application, didn't get through because then I would have gone on that. And who knows what might have happened? I might have gotten disillusioned with the whole thing, or you no, know, it would be boring. Studying with a student of Chuadasas after all, not Chuadasa himself or something. But I started studying with Chuadasa. Then we had this group. Mm. 
10 people, I think, uh, and we had a class every, every second week. And then private communication uh, by email and everything. No private one-on-one -on -one meetings, though. I never really met him in a Zoom call, for example, one-on-one. -on -one. But yes, of course, you know, ask questions in the group, group chats, and you know, he answered. We, we had a report, kind of, we had, because I was into the same philosopher he was. Greg Rosenberg, who's, uh, who wrote a book in 20, 2004 about consciousness, which uh, dwells a science in the mind illuminated in one of the uh, end notes. And I was like, you know, very few people have heard of this philosopher, even though his theory on consciousness is, is amazing. It's very, very detailed and very powerful. And sure, as I agree. So we had this kind of, you know, oh, okay, you have also heard of Greg Rosenberg, you know, like this, this thing. And, uh, and that continued, but not very long, ultimately. I mean, we were, you know, I learned a lot from him. Even though sometimes, you know, we went over, you know, the introduction of TMI, you know, basically for a, a way too long. It was kind of a bit sluggish, but still, you know, very, very nice. And all the, also the, the email communication, asking him questions by email in the, in the sessions and so on. And having this kind of, you know, having him somehow, like having this person I looked up to very much, uh, know that I exist and kind of recognize me and like me to some extent, was a very kind of, powerful in its own sake. But of course, it only lasted for like seven, eight, nine months or so, because then she realized I had a scandal with the prostitutes and, and everything, because he was dying of cancer and wanted to learn more about sexuality and so on. And he had also been slightly, he had been dishonest and caught in dishonesty, because he felt that, as he said in his long defense uh, letter, which is like 34 pages or something, I read the whole thing through, he goes every, through everything uh, by day and by time. Even at this this day, at this time, this happened. You see, and uh, the reason why he was be, had been dishonest, uh, the reason for the prostitutes was he wanted to learn more about sexuality before he died because he had he was terminally ill and everyone knew that. You know, no chance he's going to survive. You know, lung cancer, all the different illnesses. Yeah, metastasized the brain. No, no chance. Uh, so before he dies, he wants this. Um, and then the dishonesty, he wanted to protect people because he didn't quite trust them with that information, you know, because he knew that people are fallible and people are damaged quite easily sometimes, especially if they, if they kind of, if there's something about an authority figure like Charles himself that, you know, they find difficult to accept. But he kind of, you know, of course, he, he, he never really started teaching it in the same way again. Um, and yes, that's a, it's, it's, it's a, not the best end to his tale. But the rest is, you know, going through, through because it, it's been, it's been, um, yes, as always with me, um, I have always been uh, prone to being late, unfortunately. It's something that perhaps some, at some point that content, because many of my bad habits uh, I have had, like, have resolved themselves. Being late, never. I've been that, you know, from five years old, like always late to school and everything. So now also, it, it's been a bit too long. I feel, feel like, you know, uh, about stop, stop, sorry, there are some questions uh, which won't be recorded. Um, so no worries about you guys about that. But um, the rest very, very shortly, of course, after Chuadasa, I started studying with Tucker Peck, his, his student. Is maybe first big student like yeah, like he had had students before, but it was like like but he had been a very shy teacher until around the early early twenty like two thousand something, uh, and then he started becoming famous really fast because he had a very powerful mind. Charles was 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 a genius, and I've heard many people. I know a person who who who, who, who uh, I don't know anyone who's better in technique than Adi. This one guy Adi is 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 really Indian guy. Uh, and we have this, uh, we're friends, um, and Ari is an Arhat, or so he, you know, he says, and I kind of, I don't quite know what he means by it, an Arhat is, is completely liberated from suffering, personal, personally liberated from suffering, but uh, I know that no one is, I don't know anyone who's better in technique than he is, he can enter into Niro, he can enter, in, enter into cessation, like, like basically, like 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 very fast. Not maybe like that, but but whenever he wants, within you know a brief, relatively brief period of time, 
get into, the, into any journal, also the formless journals, you know, and that is really like that, you know, he can, within seconds or, you know, like, like uh, very fast or within a minute or something, you know, and it's, it's, he's very good in technique. And Adi, you know, also said, Charles is a genius. And he was, you know, very, very genius. And I started with Tucker for a while, uh, but then I, we both felt that maybe there ultimately was not so much to learn from that connection in, in, in that sense, in like that deep sense. But he gave me my Upasa name, which I don't use in these contexts, but my website is still, you know, Nietzsche Lagi. Uh, and giving the, the name Upasaka Nichalagi, uh, which means revealed fire in this hall, actually, uh, in, in uh, 20, 2020, early 2020, uh, when I started teaching properly myself. I started earlier in 2019, but it was really light. And 2020, I started teaching online because Corona, COVID, you know, and it was the b perfect opportunity to start teaching online. Upasaka Nichalagi here, because one, when I had told him that could I perhaps take the Upasaka vows, and he had told the assembly, the retreatants, that Santu is going to tom tomorrow to convert officially into Buddhism, I had kind of, you know, I had had great trouble, even now, like, it's, it's I, I, I get moved, you know, it's kind of, it touched me. And uh, Tucker saw that I had trouble, kind of, you know, keeping my face and kind of, you know, struggling against the tears. And Tucker was, you know, surprised. And then we also, uh, he, I, I, I shadowed him, uh, which means that, you know, I kind of followed him around and was in the interviews. Um, and we talked about students in the sauna, naked. And uh, Tucker is American, so, so it, it's quite uncommon to be naked with someone in such a, you know, small space. And also he hadn't been to the sauna maybe that much. And Nichalagi means revealed fire. Revealed, revealed flame, so it was revealed passion for you know, Dharma, which you know was suddenly kind of, he kind of felt you know okay you're actually very much into this you're really into this stuff it's important really important to you like like it it is for me, and also of course the joke in the sauna naked you no know, so the revealed flame. So yeah, but sorry with Tucker for a while. Uh, and then was between teachers for a while, then Lee. Uh, and by then I had been so much of a jhana junkie and really stuck on jhanas because jhanas are great. But I didn't do much else. And Lee told me, of course, he's a teacher of jhana, but he also told me about, taught me about emptiness quite a lot. And then I had my first insights into emptiness. Really, this kind of that everything is actually primordial, just as it is, relaxed. It's always perfect in this sense because it's always just as it is. And nothing else, and it has no name. Whatever suffering we have arises from names. That's a topic, of course, for another talk. It's important for also the, the for the like. Uh, it's definitely a topic that will come up in, for example, tomorrow when we give a talk. Emptiness again in more detail. But the suffer our suffering arises from names, and that's something the Buddha found out. Nama rupa, they're distinct. Nama is name, rupa is form. Name and form are distinct. They're not the same thing. Rupa, or phenomenal reality, has no name. I mean, none of this has any names in itself. It's in, the Buddha doesn't have a name. It doesn't know. It, it doesn't know anything. But we name it, and if we hate flaws, then you know there might be suffering arising from that hatred of flaws, for example, or whatever is stem, whatever that hatred stems from. Maybe we have slipped on flaws before. It arises from those that name, that meaning attributed to the floor. You know, I slipped on a floor once and, and it hurt. There was pain and pain is bad. It's all just names, ultimately. It's names built on other names, concepts built out of concepts and so on. And he told me, you know, some of this and then I had the experience. It has no name. It's perfect. It has to be. It's the only logical conclusion. You know. And there was great relief. And then so I would leave for a year and a half or so, and we will probably get back in touch, you know, with this only before I went to India, you know, with, with, let, yeah, let, let, send me pictures about India, Lee, Lee's also been on a pilgrimage in India twice, uh, and, you know, let's get, let's get, you know, let, let's talk after that, you know, you know, let's get back, to, back, back, uh, back in touch or something, perhaps, 
but neither, neither one of has so far. So it's it's you know, we'll see what comes out of it. It's no no two student teacher relationship is, is perhaps you know perhaps even meant to be forever because we learn so much about you know from other 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 people, different kinds of people. So now I'm kind of between teachers in that sense. Perhaps it depends on what happens with with me now, and me and me. But uh, I. I'm of course incredibly grateful to him as and, and to all of my teachers, which are infinite. So many people ever since that you know, young age, being like a hyperactive kid, you know, even bully the people who bullied me, teachers, of course, teaching me about myself and eventually teaching me, you know, about about you know my suffering, what pains me, and so on. And all of this, of course, continues, and again, you know. I've also seen, I have not met a perfect human being, I, I'm not quite sure if a perfect human being exists, and much actual does that. Of course flawed, but he was a genius, and he gave me much, and he has, he has given many other people in this room. And um, I only hope that flawed human being, as I, might, as, I, as I am, I might be able to have beneficial impact on people, which is really the only thing I have almost ever wanted to do. I had, this is the last thing I'm going to say, that it, it's also a bit of a joke. Um, when my dad asked me, what, what do I want to do in life, when I was, you know, maybe 15 or 16, I said three things, one of which I can't remember, but the other two were, the, the third was also insignificant, but the other two were, the, the big ones were, I want children, I want to be a father, and I want to grow a beard. And everything else is just whatever, you know. And maybe, you know, the third, I can remember the third one, but that would be, I want to be of benefit. I want to be of benefit. It's, it's, it's also here, I think, the only thing that makes any sense. You know, why, what else is higher than being of benefit? And the ways that has been for me, Ultimately, spiritual practice, it has been meditation, mostly meditation, also other things, other techniques. Tai Chi is great, by the way, that's very good for, you know, body, very good for balance, very good for many things. Dancing is also great, also for letting go. Um, but meditation is, nothing has given me as much as meditation, and especially in quite a bit of suffering. That's, that's the... And that was the, the thing I learned from Robert Bayat. This is actually the, the last thing. Robert Bayat posthumously gave me the spark for the Mahayana path when I was stuck on emptiness. Because you can get stuck on emptiness too. It's a bit nihilistic, ultimately, if you're just, you know, stuck in this view that, you know, nothing has no name. And that's it. Robert Bayat, you know, his, his talks and, and his, you know, PDFs and everything gave, gave me the spark only just a bit over a year ago, properly, properly. I mean, Lee also had taught me some, something about Dzogchen and Mahayana, but we're very properly into this, that you can also sculpt that nameless emptiness into something loving. So there is not just the equanimity of emptiness, that you're okay with, you know, whatever happens, but that you actually have the spark of bodhicitta and that you actually have the spark for you know you know for love and actually that's what Chuadas also said or told told us all the time. It's just that I might I was perhaps not as you know that was not the thing that struck me back then. But now it, it's time to end this and we still have time for questions fortunately.